Okay, well, um, good morning and uh, happy Father's Day to those of you who that applies to. Uh, um, let's um, pick up where we left off last week in the book of 2 Corinthians. Um, and as you notice, there's no scripture references down there because we're going to kind of take a little bigger section and not, um, uh, not refer to many scriptures and the ones that that were referred to, I'll just read to you, and you can follow along. So, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, and we'll consider through verse 13. So, I'll read that, and then we'll pray, and then we'll, we'll consider it. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listen to you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors yet are true, as unknown yet well known, as dying, and behold, we live, as punished, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. <clears throat> in return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. Let's pray. Father, again, as we come before you and consider your word, I pray that uh, what Paul says by inspiration of the Spirit here that we are repeating uh, is, um, is true. It's edifying to all that are present, and may I certainly not misspeak or misrepresent what uh, you are conveying to us. But just be with us as we study your word, and may we be uh, built up by it. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Okay, so I entitled this section, uh, Life of a Minister of the Gospel, or a life of the minister of, that has the ministry of reconciliation. Because as you recall in the preceding verses, that is what Paul is stating that we all are. Okay, we're not speaking of paid ministers, ministers that are full-time ministers, we're speaking of every true believer, every saved uh, person that God has, has been given to us this ministry of reconciliation. Uh, in verse 19 of chapter 5, right before, um, <clears throat> he says this, the ministry of reconciliation through the word of reconciliation, the word of God, the word of the gospel. And then in verse 20, he calls, he says, we are all then ambassadors for Christ. Uh, and as ambassadors, we spoke of that last week a little bit, um, as ambassadors, we're not working for ourselves, we're working for our king, whoever makes us the ambassador, which would be God, uh, and we do his work, his bidding, we use his words and what he teaches us, it's his ministry, but he has entrusted that to us. And so when Paul in, in chapter 6 here speaks of, life in the ministry, and he will be describing many things that happened in his life as well, but he's speaking to all of us, all of us a life in the ministry. A life in the ministry will, will be manifest by what we're going to talk about today, ups and downs, you know, highs and lows. It, we're going to be looked at by the world as, as worthless, as poor, pitiful, but we possess everything, as he says at the end. So Paul describes his life... Um, and then he uh, appeals to the Corinthians that they should do the same thing. They do not 
treat the grace that God has given them through salvation in vain. So again, the background again, uh, this, this letter that Paul writes to the Second Corinthians, he's under attack by false teachers or apostles that have uh, entered into the church at Corinth um, and have attacked Paul um, in order to get their false uh, uh, gospel, their, or not their false gospel, their false teachings into the church. And they um, would say things about Paul so that he's not teaching the true gospel. He, he would, they, would, um, uh, they would accuse him of not teaching the truth of the word uh, or things like he had a hidden agenda. He wasn't in it. He was in it for himself, and he wasn't in it for the church at Corinth. He didn't really love them. He, he had a hidden agenda. Or things like he, the reason he went through so many beatings and troubles and afflictions was that he had some kind of secret life of sin that God was chastising him for. That was one of their accusations also. And, and, and one of the big ones was that he didn't really care for the people in the church. Paul was out for Paul. But we know that that's not true. And in, um, and in the first letter to Corinthians, remember Paul addressed several issues, errors that the church was making, uh, and he addressed them in a truthful, loving way. Um, and in the second letter that we've been uh, uh, going over the last several weeks, <clears throat> he, he is defending himself to the church at Corinth against the accusations made by the false teachers. There were also false accusations. And he's not defending himself because of his reputation, but he's defending himself because he knows that if he doesn't, that they will be misled by these false teachers and not hear the true gospel and the true word of God. So he is defending himself for the Corinthian church themselves. Um, so in this, in this section here, he describes his, uh, his life as a minister, the highs and lows, uh, being shunned by the world, but, but certainly known and loved by God, uh, hated by some, loved by others, and he, he describes the weapons and the, the resources that he uses to, to weather uh, these ups and downs and these trials that he goes through. And so he appeals also to the church at Corinth to do the same. Uh, and remember, when he's speaking of his life as a minister, he, he is also speaking to each and every one of us because we are all uh, ambassadors for Christ. We all have this ministry that's been given to us. Uh, if you are a true believer, that is why you are here and the purpose for why you're here at this, at this moment while you're still breathing, let's put it that way. Um, so he starts in, in chapter 6, verse 1. He says, working together with him, and we have to understand what him is, or who him is. Him obviously refers back to the verse before, speaking of God. God, the one that made Christ sin who knew no sin. Uh, so that we might become the righteousness of God. So we are working together with God. Uh, and and just, just for a moment on that, working together. You know, the, uh, a lot of people, once they become uh, believers, um, somehow they get this idea that it's, it's all ease and comfort from here on out. You know, I've got my ticket to heaven. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to kind of chill out until he returns or until I die. So I'm going to relax. But that is not not the life of a Christian or life of a minister of the gospel of Christ. Um, we must labor, we must work in this ministry as an ambassador, as an ambassador. Now, that being said, working, does God really need us to do his job? Does God, God really need us to have his sovereign plan uh, come to fruition? Does he really need our work? And we know the answer to that is no. He can certainly do it without us. But why are we, why are we to work for him and with him? And, and it's one of the commentaries I read, and I think you've probably heard these examples before. It's similar to, and this is dad's day, so it's going to be a dad example, okay? So a dad with his son going to have a project, something to do, whether it be mowing the yard, building something like that. And the son wants to help, okay? The 
dad then takes him out there, teaches him, works with him. Now, the dad could have gotten that project done a whole lot quicker if he didn't have his son around. And that's kind of God. God can certainly do things without us, but as it is a privilege for the son to have a father that would show him to do those things, it's a privilege for us to be able to work for God. Even though we know he can do it himself, okay, it's our privilege to do that. So it's a very, it's a privilege to work together with him. Um, and also I have to make the point, he's not working with us, okay? So in other words, we don't kind of make our plans and then say, okay, God, you bless this plan and this will be for you. You know, that, that's not the way it works. We are working um, with him in his plan, like an ambassador who is, who is commissioned to go to another country, the, the, his king or his sovereign tells him what to do. His sovereign tells him what to say. Um, he's, he's taking care of the king's agenda and not his own agenda. Um, and then the king expects him to do his job, right? Expects him to do what he put him there to do, as does God expect us to do. So, in, in, and then in the second half of that verse, he says, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. So, what's he saying here? That was a little confusing to me, because when we think of grace, we think of the grace that God gives us in salvation. And, and, that, and we know that that grace that he gives us in salvation had its effect. It will save us. Uh, we will be his forever. Um, so, how can that grace ever be in vain. Um, so what's he saying? You know, we, we understand grace. Grace is, is that, that undeserved merit that God places on us. We didn't deserve salvation. He gave it to us. We don't deserve another breath every day. We don't deserve the food we eat. We don't deserve the uh, things that he has given us to make life nice on this. We don't deserve any of that, but nonetheless, he gives us that out of his grace, out of his undeserved merit. So the grace, certainly in salvation that he's given us, will have its intended effect. But he gives grace every day. It's grace upon grace upon grace. And that grace spills over, obviously, into even unbelievers and believers. You know, it, it rains on the just and the unjust. You know, the, he allows even unbelievers to to survive another day, to live comfortably and, you know, have uh, maybe be wealthy and experience the good things that this earth has to offer. But in the believers, that grace that he gives us each and every day, same as to the unbelievers, but it in us has a different effect. It in us will encourage us, it will empower us, to do his will. And so it, it empowers us, that grace that God gives you every day, not only does it um, encourage us, empower us, but it's that grace that is sanctifying us every day, that grace that he pours on us makes us more and more like him every day. So the closest kind of uh, passage that, that kind of talks about using this grace in vain is when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, you know, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Say, by God's grace, I am a sinner saved only by his grace, right? And then he said, but then he goes on and says, and his grace towards me was not in vain. He says, on the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me. So, so the grace of God saved Paul, but God continues to pour grace on Paul, and, that, and, and as he does in all believers, and so, in some form or fashion, he, he's still getting grace, but in some form or fashion, if he didn't work so hard, he had that grace, he used that grace in vain, or that grace was somewhat in vain. But he worked harder, he used that grace as, as, as well. So, what he's saying to the Corinthians, basically, is this, he's encouraging them, he's saying, take the grace God gives you and use it. That's what he's saying. God has given you this grace every day. Do not waste it. Do not waste it. Uh, and he might be saying something to Corinthians because of these false teachers. You know, God's given you 
all this grace, this undeserved uh, favor. He's, listen, he sent, he sent Paul here to found the church. He had Apollos, a good teacher that taught him. He had Peter came in. They've had good teachers that have demonstrated the grace of God and have brought the true word of God to him. And now you're listening to these false apostles, these false teachers who are trying to teach you a different doctrine. He says, no, use that grace that God gives you every day to work for the ministry of reconciliation, for the ministry of the gospel of, of Christ. So that's what he's doing. He's, he, he's, he's basically telling him not to waste the grace that God has given to him. And then in verse 2, he goes, he quotes Isaiah 49, 8, which um, he says, For in a favorable time I listened to you, in a day of salvation I have helped you. That's a quote from Isaiah 49, 8, which, as we all know, and as even the Hebrews would know, this is messianic. This is, this is speaking of that in a time God is going to send the Messiah for salvation. That's the idea behind that. And he did, okay? And when he came, he, he did what? He, he, he saved those that were his. He, you know, gave them the heart of, he changed the heart of stone to the heart of flesh. He, in Jeremiah, he placed the law in our hearts now. Uh, that, that is the new covenant. And so he, he speaks of that, and as he, he quotes it, and then Paul says this, behold, okay? God said he was going to send that Messiah, but behold, now listen to me. That's what he's saying. He says, now is the favorable time. And behold, now is the day of salvation. Meaning that it won't always be the favorable time. Okay, we are considered that we're in the age of grace now, that, uh, that Christ has died and paid the death, and so we are in this age of grace. But, but that age of grace will end at a point in time when all his elect have come to him, that time will, will end. Uh, so when he's saying now is a favorable time, you know, it kind of implies there, there at some point won't be a favorable time. And so he's lighting a fire under them. He's getting them encouraged. Now is the time you do what I've told you to do. Now is the time for the ministry of the gospel. So he's, he's giving them a sense of urgency by, by saying that. And then in verse 3, he says, we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. Uh, Paul wants to make sure that he himself and his apostles and all those that, um, that are his, that are Christ, they do nothing that would somehow put a stumbling block in front of others, in front of the message of the gospel of Christ. As you recall, Paul... Um, uh, in the first book of Corinthians, states that he did not take any pay for preaching the gospel because that could potentially be a stumbling block to someone who's hearing the gospel. They might say he's just in it for the money, uh, you know, this and that. Um, Paul also uh, traveled around all these different things. He was never placed in a high position in front of the apostles. Remember, he wasn't one of the 12, so he was kind of an outcast anyway, uh, but he never uh, desired or chose to be elevated above who God made him to be, and that was to preach the word to the Gentiles. Um, and so he worked all day and night, preached the gospel, uh, lived a pure life, because uh, if he did not live a pure life, that could also be a stumbling block to someone uh, who heard, hears the gospel from his mouth. Um, and he did this all so that the ministry of, of the gospel would be found blameless. He wants to make sure that it's found blameless. So, and it's ironic because the things that, that Paul did and not wanting to put, he, put these uh, obstacles in any one way or not wanting to put these stumbling blocks in the way of anyone was exactly what the false teachers were accusing him of. They're accusing him of having ulterior motives. They're accusing him of being in it for the money. They're accusing it for, you know, that he was, he was in it for himself. He didn't really love them, but, uh, but that's not who he was. I think we know that from, from studying him uh, closely. So now in, in Paul's ministry, he, he, he kind of tells us here he didn't want to put a, a stumbling block or an obstacle in anyone's way. So in our ministry, the same holds true. 
we do not want to put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of God. And so what's one way, what's probably the biggest way that we can do that, putting that obstacle in, in God, in, in an obstacle in front of unbelievers uh, to the gospel of God? And the biggest way really is that our life doesn't reflect what we're saying. Okay? I mean, that, you hear that all the time. I'm not going to that church. They're a bunch of hypocrites, right? And so our life must reflect what we are preaching. Okay? We have been handed this ministry. We don't want to put any of our obstacles in the way of that. Um, so the biggest ob obstacle to that is that someone who proclaims the gospel, um, life does not manifest what he is saying. And they're no better than the hypocrites that Jesus uh, accused the Pharisees of, being, um, you know, whitewashed tombs. You know, they, 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 uh, they did not do what they said they did. The Pharisees would put all these laws on people and they wouldn't do it themselves. Okay, that's what we have to avoid. So if we profess Christ, we, we can't have a life that is uh, characterized by some type of consistent sin that we're doing and justifying it somehow. So if we profess Christ, we, we can't have a life that's all about ourselves and all about worldly desires and doing things of this world. Um, if we profess Christ, our life must show it. We must have a life of service to Christ, to others, uh, and we must be continually putting to death those, those continual sins that we have. I'm not saying we, we're going to be sinless, but we know that, but we must be continually repenting of those and putting them to, to death uh, when they arise in us. So that, that's what Paul's saying. As a minister of the gospel, he's saying himself as well as those in the Corinthian church that are true believers and are also ministers, do not put any obstacle in the way of the gospel because of the way you live. And then in verse 4, he says, it's simply, but as servants of God. And that's probably the simplest title that we can think of ourselves as saved individuals. That's the title Paul gave to himself. He wasn't, you know, commander-in-chief of the apostles or anything like that. He was just a servant of God. And as a servant, he appoint, he's appointed ambassador. Um, and so that should be really all of our credentials as a believer, plain and simple, a servant of God, a servant of God. And Paul would say several times he would tell the Corinthian church and other places to imitate himself as he imitates Christ. So we should do that also. So, and then as a, as a minister of the gospel, uh, all of us must endure the ups and downs of that, the trials of, not only the trials of just normal life in a fallen world, but the trials that are brought upon us by our, uh, our preaching of the gospel and our, the life that we live in a fallen world that, that will uh, certainly accuse us of, well, you know what they accuse us of. Um, so that word that is translated into ESV, um, by great endurance, and King James, it just says patience, uh, but it's really more than patience. You know, patience kind of gets the idea, you just kind of kind of sit back with your hands folded and kind of waiting for something to kind of go on by. Uh, but it's, it's more than that. The word, the hupomene, I think I'm saying it right, uh, really means more kind of persevering through trials, you know, triumphantly, persevering to the point where you're not, uh, when trials come, that you're not um, getting mad at God. Uh, when trials come that are brought on by other people, you're not getting mad at them for them. Um, and during all this, you know, you're, you're, you're triumphant. You're, you're not depressed. You're not getting down because things aren't going like you want them to go. So we're enduring, and that is, that is the characteristic of any minister of the gospel. That's the characteristic of any believer in Jesus Christ who is a minister of the gospel. It's important that we endure. And so in the next section, then, Paul, Paul gives us um, some lists, some groups of things. Uh, in verses uh, 4 and 5, he, 
he kind of groups them into groups of three. Uh, the first group is uh, kind of general trials and situations that living in a fallen world, being a, a minister of Christ, will bring upon you. The second group is, is things that were brought upon you by other unbelievers, other men, other that they afflict you with that. And then the third is really a group that he, that he brings upon himself. They're kind of self-inflicted distresses and things. Self and the things he does for the gospel, he brings himself. So we'll briefly kind of go over that. The first group there is um, uh, afflictions, hardships, calamities in the ESV. Afflictions, that, that Greek word there, really just means to put pressure upon. And so afflictions could be something that's brought upon you from the outside, but it can also mean the pressure that you put on yourself, okay, for preaching of the gospel, the pressure that you put on yourself um, to live a pure life. Uh, hardships, uh, this, the normal hardships of living in a fallen world, the, the constraints, the things that, uh, that we all face, um, especially as being believers in a fallen world. And then the, world tra the word translate calamities really just means kind of a narrow place, and, 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 and it gets the idea of um, going down a, a, like a narrow canyon or gourd where you're looking for a way out, but you can't find it. So it's those things that, those things you face in life, the situations where you just can't find a way out. Okay, those are stresses that are placed on you, afflictions that are placed on you every day, and that's just part of, part of our life uh, in this world. But then the second group is, is, is beatings, imprisonments, right? Those are obviously things that, that Paul experienced, and those are things that are given to him or placed on him by others. Um, you know, in, in uh, chapter 11 of this book, he, he mentions that five times he, he got the 40 lashes minus one, three times with rods, and... Um, many times in Acts, he was beaten, stoned. Uh, he was imprisoned. Acts 16, 22, 23, 24, 26, 28. He was imprisoned in all those. So Paul was well-versed on being in prison. Uh, and then riots. You know, riots usually preceded the imprisonments. You know, they, some he'd go into a, uh, to a town, preach the gospel in the synagogue. Finally, they'd get tired of him preaching the true word of God because they loved their sin. They would start a riot for whatever reason, um, and then he ended up in jail. That was, that was Paul's life. Those are things done to him by others. Um, and then the last little group of, of things there is um, uh, uh, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. These are more self-inflicted things, Th self that he, he did, Paul did to himself, and we do our, to ourselves to um, to present the gospel to others. And, and labors, Paul, specifically in labors, you know, Paul, like we talked about, he never took money for preaching the gospel. He had a job, oh, he supported himself. Those in his party, you know, he tra didn't travel alone. He would have others with him in his party. Um, and he would work day and night to present the gospel free of charge so there would not be an obstacle that he was, that they could say he was getting, he was in it for the money. Um, and he told, in 1 Thessalonians 2.9, he, he kind of reminds those at the church at Thessalonica, it says, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil, we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, while we proclaim, proclaim to you the gospel of God. And then for the purpose, he told Timothy in his first letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy 4.10, he says, for to, this, for to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. That's a good verse. We'll talk about that, but not right now. Um, and then he goes, sleepless nights, sleepless nights. Uh, you know, he, if he worked all day, present the gospel at night or vice versa, um, he obviously would miss some sleep. And then hunger, you know, he worked, but he wasn't always, he didn't always have everything he needed. And so there would be times where he and his party would go without food, without food. It would, he would experience that. But he was content in all those. When he had a lot and when he had a little, he had that contentment. So these are things that he, he would uh, bring upon himself, but things that, we, that he dealt with, that ministers of the gospel, in some form or fashion, 
we need endurance to get through these trials of life, whether it's just the general trials or those brought on by others or those things that we bring upon ourselves. We need to have that endurance. And so then in the next verses, he, he begins to list the resources. How does he get that endurance? Where does that endurance come from? Well, we all know where it comes from, but he lists them very well here that I think uh, will take a few minutes to talk about them. He says, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, Holy Spirit, genuine love. Okay, the first two there, purity and knowledge. You know, Paul, Paul kept his life pure because it didn't want it to be an obstacle to the, uh, to the gospel. Um, and, but how did he know, again, what was pure? And he knew that through knowledge, through the knowledge of the truth of the Word of God. Um, and where did that knowledge come from? That knowledge came from God. And 2 Peter 1.3 pretty much says it the, the best, saying, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So it's, it's God's power that has given us all things that we need to live a pure life, a life that's honoring to God, through the knowledge of him who called us. So we have to have the knowledge and it's to his own glory and, and, and excellence. So we have to have the knowledge to perform that. And, and Paul had that. He had directly gotten the knowledge from the Lord, and he passed it on. He lived a life of purity. That was, that was his, um, one of his resources, one of the power that he got. And then if you look at the last few there, patience, kindness, Holy Spirit, genuine love, we list three of the fruits of the Spirit there, and the Spirit itself. So Paul used... The Spirit working in him through the fruits generated in him to endure trials. I think we all, when we look at that, that passage in Galatians, we look at that. Those aren't just things that the Spirit gives us to demonstrate to other people, but it's also things that we use for ourselves to endure as well, the patience. And when you're kind to someone, you're not continually mad at someone, right? You, you, you use those things to to endure uh, the, the trials that we face. And then verse 7, truthful speech and the power of God. Uh, truthful speech, that, that could almost be translated the word of truth. I mean, it's logos and it's, it's truthful on that. So, so Paul's speech was always truthful because Paul knew the word of truth. The simplest way to put that. Um, and that word of truth is given to all believers in Christ. And that is the words that we must speak. And it doesn't change. It, and we don't compromise it. Uh, but we use it. We use it. And Paul knew that that was the power of God, that his word. In Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel, the word of God, is the power unto salvation. So he used that power to endure. And then... Uh, he goes on to, the, uh, to speak of these weapons of righteousness for the right hand and left. It's kind of interesting why he puts that in there, but we've all heard of the, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, where he describes this later about uh, the armor of God. And so I think what he, if you kind of put it in context, what he's saying here, he's, he's speaking of these weapons, this armor of God that he speaks of later in the right hand and left, okay? And, you know, when they fought back in those times, it wasn't with a gun or thing. You know, they had a sword in one hand, a shield in the other hand. So the right hand would be like the offensive weapon, okay, and the left hand would be the defensive weapon. So the sword in, in the armor of God is the sword of the spirit. Yeah, it's the spirit. It's the word of God. It's the spirit that lives with us that allows us to... Um, uh, attack these strongholds, uh, you know, that he, he says as, as uh, later as well. And then, in, uh, and then the shield is the shield of faith where, you know, we can fight off the, the devil and what he throws at us. Not only will he throw at us uh, words and, and, um, uh, and accusations like he did Paul, but, you know, he also has all those temptations out there as well that we could easily just kind of drop that shield down. So he says you need to use the sword. You need to be offensive about it. 
but you also need to defend yourself because the devil will attack you for these things. And so all these resources came from God, right? It all came from God. And so then verses 8 through 10, now he tells us, I have to be quick about this, now he tells us how the world views believers, how the world views Christians, how the world views ministers of the gospel of Christ. Now, the word that we preach doesn't change. The gospel doesn't change. What we preach doesn't change. But certainly the response we get to it changes moment by moment. Uh, you know, to one, to those that will um, reject it, it's a, uh, it's a realm of death to death. I mean, that's, he speaks of that earlier as well. Um, but to those who who are touched by it in the spirit and uh, are humbled by it and repent of their sins and turn to Christ, it's a message of life to life. But for those who don't, it's a message of death to death. And that is the majority of the people in the world. They, are, they reject the gospel. Uh, they love their sin. And so what they do is they will attack a minister or any Christian that professes that. Uh, and let's just go through, uh, this, is, this is what you experienced. And, and Paul experienced that. Remember, he'd, when he'd go into the town, he'd go into the synagogue. That's where he'd always go. And he professed Christ. And it seems like they'd let him hang around a few weeks. But then eventually, some would believe and some would kick him out. And then everything would start there. And that is exactly how it still happens today. Some will believe the same message and some will uh, rail at it. Some will attack you for it. Um, and so that's how the world will, will view all Christians. And it says, um, so in verse 8, he says, we do this through honor and dishonor. I mean, to, to those that are saved, to those that, um, that have accepted that the Christ has put uh, uh, his spirit inside that and who know that the words you're preaching is that, they may honor you. They may think highly of you. But the majority of them will not. You will be dishonored. You'll be dishonored. Same as through slander and praise. They, those that do not accept the gospel will slander you. The world will slander you. But others that, that do know you, know your heart, knew Paul, would praise him. That's the life of a, of a Christian. I think it says we are treated as imposters. You know, that was one of the, the accusations against Paul was that he wasn't a true apostle. He was an imposter. He was a fraud. Um, yet... He knew he was true. He knew he had the true word of God that he sent to him. And that is, uh, that's what all will experience. And he says it unknown yet well known. Uh, you know, Paul, before he, was, uh, um, before he was converted on the Damascus Road, was well known in the hierarchy of the Pharisees. He had exceeded those that were with him and was marching up the ladder um, of being well known in that thing. But once he became a preacher of the gospel, he's a virtual unknown. He's in this city, that city, that city for parts of time. He's not given any kind of title other than the one God gave him as an apostle. So he knows that he is well-known, well-known to God, well-known to God. So although in this world, uh, preachers of the gospel may be relatively unknown, okay, they are known to God. We are known to God. And then it says, as dying, yet behold, we live, you know, as punished, yet not killed. Paul faced death every day. Um, and to the world, it looked like, you know, they were going to finish him off. They would punish him. They would stone him. They'd imprint him. But he was not killed. He was, he was still alive. And what you have to understand is that until the day, until his job was done, <laughs> okay, until God was done with Paul and his purposes for him, he was immortal. No one could touch him. Okay, they punish him, beat him up, do things like that, but he was immortal. He would survive until that day. And that is true for each and every one of us also. We are immortal. So that should give us great confidence, certainly endurance during, that, during this time. And then verse 10 says, As sorrowful yet always rejoicing, you know, sorrowful, you know, I guess the, the world would, would, would 
look at us and say, you know, we have, we're, we're sorrowful over our sin. We're sorrowful over those sinners. We have this burden on the sinners as well. We're sorrowful for them, yet we're always rejoicing because we know that God can save us. We know that God has saved us and can save those that we are sorrowing over. And then the last two, as poor yet making many rich. I love that one. Paul had nothing of value in this world, died with nothing, but he made many rich in Christ. And, and that's what we do also. Uh, and as having nothing, nothing in this world, but possessing everything, the inheritance that we have that is waiting for us in, in, in uh, heaven. Um, and then he finishes up just briefly since we're doing it. Um, his plea to the Corinthians for, for, for the love that he has shown them was kind of unrequited to them. Uh, but we know that earlier he had told them how much he loves them as well. And he just, he's just pleading to them uh, that, you know, yes, I do love you. Don't listen to those false apostles that said I'm in it for myself. I do this because I love you. I care for you. I am your spiritual father. And as a father, I want the best for you. And the best for them would be to believe, would be to turn back to Paul and away from those false apostles. So, so the life of a... Of a um, a minister of the gospel, you know, we work for God. We, we encourage others to work for God, not to use what grace God's given them in vain. We, we preach boldly, but under much stress. We, um, we're going to see acceptance. We're going to see rejection. We're going to see honor. We're going to see slander. Um, we have nothing, but we possess everything. So let's pray. Father, we thank you again so much for your word and the, uh, uh, the encouragement that it gives us. We understand the truth of it. And that through the resources that you've given us in the word of God, that we can endure all things on this earth and all things for you. Uh, may we do that and not use the grace you've given us in vain. In your son's name, amen.